I am very, very pleased to be with you this morning and uh, to have a chance to be in this pulpit. And uh, I've been looking forward to it ever since Nick and I had lunch sometime last summer. I think it was in August. Nick uh, said, gee, would you like to come preach sometime at first? And I said, would I? And so here I am, and I'm very, very pleased about it. I've actually worshipped with you uh, online a time or two and seen this worship service and your pastors at work and your choir. And I've uh, worshipped at the first service as well, and I know you're blessed with wonderful leadership, and you are blessed with a choir. Uh, Thank you for uh, the music that you picked. Spot on. What a man. I love choirs and music uh, directors who take a look at the scripture and then find just the right anthem to complement what the preacher is going to try to say. You know, you are very privileged to have a choir, especially a choir this size and this good. It's becoming very rare. You probably don't get around much, but I do. It's becoming rare. Take good care of your choir and your musicians and uh, continue to uh, support them in every way. Well, uh, I'm grateful for uh, Pam's reading of the parable of the ten virgins. It's, as she said, a a parable about being prepared. And um, it turns out that there were ten virgins who had lamps to be ready to welcome the bridegroom. And five of them were prepared when the bridegroom got there, and five weren't. There are things that are sometimes too late to prepare for. It's too late already sometimes. And sometimes it's not too late yet. Here's some background about uh, the parable. In Jesus' day, as in our own day, weddings are a big deal, and they take up a lot of time and certainly a lot of resources. In Jesus' day, weddings lasted for a whole week. And they, if you were in a small village, they not only in, involved the groom's friends and the bride's friends, they involved usually the whole village. And the funny thing about it was um, that uh, the groom uh, showed up whenever he showed up. The bride's friends. Some mothers are going, hmm, that sounds familiar. Um, the bride's family would have everything all going, ready for the wedding. The bride's best friends, the ten virgins, would be ready to meet the groom. And the groom, by tradition, could show up when he wanted to. Maybe in the morning, maybe in the afternoon, maybe after it was dark. And if he showed up after dark, then you needed to have your lamps ready and burning. Now, you're an older congregation than the first one, so you'll remember how many people can remember from their Sunday school or youth ministry a thousand years ago the song that came out of this uh, out of this passage (laughs) got it give me oil in my lamp keep me burn keep it burning give me oil in my lamp I pray give me oil in my lamp keep me burning 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 till the break of day. Don't let me be like the virgins who goofed up. (laughs) So when uh, the bridegroom finally at last appeared, uh, the uh, ten virgins uh, would uh, begin to lead a a parade to the bride's house. So the ten virgins, the bridesmaids, and uh, the, all of their buddies, all of the families of the groom and the bride, and the whole village would make this kind of parade, a noisy, happy, celebrative parade to the bride's house. Now, um, the thing is, um, the wedding feast is a symbol that Jesus used several times to stand for the kingdom of God. And the introduction to the parable is, at, when that day comes, when the kingdom comes, it will be like this. When God's kingdom comes, it will be like this. God will have invited everybody to come to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Does that sound familiar, biblically? Well, invited everybody to come to the feast. 
but not everybody will be there. On a canna, not everybody will be ready. Jesus' warning is, you don't know when I'm coming. So be ready whenever it is, because some things can't be gotten after it's too late. Some things can't be borrowed that you might need when the king comes. Nobody can love God back for you or me. Nobody can confess their sin and accept Jesus' forgiveness for you or me. Nobody can live Jesus' way in Jesus' world for you or me. And when the king comes, it will be a time of judgment over what we have done. And the king will want to know, what did we do? And are we ready to meet him? Or are we not? And if we're not ready, there's just some things that can't be borrowed, some things that can't be gotten when it's too late. So the question is, did we live in Jesus' world, Jesus' way, or did we live some other way? Did we just live, you know, haphazardly any old way? Did we live the way that all the people in our socioeconomic class said we ought to live? Did we live the way all of our buddies said? When one of my sons went away to college, I said, how come you didn't go to that other college? He said, Dad, that's just a party school. You can only party so much. I went, Phew, wow, we worked. We raised a good kid. But, you know, you can, you can live the way the party people live. You can live according to your ideology. Jesus said, the king is coming. Jesus will come back a second time. And here's the thing that we tend to forget. When Jesus comes at the second coming, he will come back to judge the living and the dead. Exactly as we say in the the Apostles' Creed. And he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And Jesus said, and the New Testament says at least four or five other times, he will judge everybody by what they have done. Not necessarily about whether they went to church. Not necessarily even about what they believed. You know, Scripture says, even the demons believe and they tremble but what they have done. Now, I'm, I'm a Presbyterian Reformed pastor, and my executive presbyter is sitting, behold, right there. Have I forgotten that we are saved by grace through faith? I have not. That was the first verse my dad taught me when I was seven. For by grace we've been saved through faith. And that is not your own doing, is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace, but we're still going to be judged by Jesus for what we have done. We will make an accounting for our lives and what we have done and not done. Sometimes, um, sometimes I'll see somebody, you know, when I'm out and about, do something just spectacularly rotten. And in a smug Christian way, I will think, oh, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when you stand before the risen, glorified Lord Jesus and try to explain that. Then if I'm being a good theologian, sometimes I am when I'm not in the pulpit, when I'm being a good theologian, I think, yeah, smarty, smarty pants, you're going to have the chance to be there when somebody makes an accounting of their life, and that's you. You'll be there when you try to explain some things to the risen Savior. Paul said, we'll be saved, but some of us are going to be saved like on the other side of fire. So Jesus said, look, you don't know when I'm coming back. You don't know when that day will come. So be ready every day. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read a passage from uh, the prophet Amos. 
And before I do, I want to set the context for it. If you want, you can read the book of Amos at home this week. It's not that many chapters, and uh, it's an active read, I'll tell you that. Here's the context. In that time in Israel, when Amos was prophesying, things were going great. The armies of Israel were victorious in their battles. The economy was booming. Most people, most people uh, were enjoying great prosperity. The, his, the political arena was going swell. Uh, worship attendance was up in Israel. People were keeping all of the festivals, all the right sacrifices were being made. The traditions were being upheld just as they ought to have been upheld. And the happy religious people of Israel were looking forward to that day, to the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, just like that day in the New Testament, the day of the Lord is when Israel knew that God would come, come to earth and vindicate himself as the real God, the creator and the Lord of history and space and time. And when God came back on that day, he would vindicate Israel and its faith, and he would settle the hash of all those other wicked nations. So Israel was looking forward to that day. So that leads us to Amos 5. What God's happy religious people couldn't imagine was that while they were happy and looking forward to that day, God did not share their view. This is Amos 5, 18 to 24, verse 24, the last verse, one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a person fred, fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though you entered your house and rested your hand on the wall, only to have a snake bite you. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without a ray of brightness? God says, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, there are some passages where I think the liturgical response ought to be a little different. This is the word of the Lord. And God's people go, oh my goodness. So, um, God is clearly, what? Angry. Ticked off. What's God all up in a bunch about? Worship attendance is up. Things are going swell from the people's point of view. So here's the rest of the context for Amos' prophecy. Worship attendance really was up at the Jewish festivals, but so was attendance at the worship services of all the idols of the gods and goddesses of the people that Israel lived among. And not only were all those people there, the non-Israelite pagans, God's people were worshiping at the idols' spots of worship. 
They were worshiping Yahweh, their God, as if God was one, one God among many. They believed in God. It's not like they threw away God. They believed in God. It's just all those other gods offered some great stuff too. All those other gods promised that your wives would be fertile and you'd have a lot of children, especially sons. And uh, that you would prosper and that God would make the rain fall and your crops would grow. In some sense, Israel was just fitting in with the rest of the world. Just doing the things that everybody else did. You got to go along to get along, right? I mean, what did it hurt that Israel was faithfully worshiping God, but also worshiping the gods and goddesses of the peoples? Well, to begin with, it hurt God. It wounded God the way a marital affair hurts a marriage, the way embezzlement hurts a business. It was, in fact, blasphemous. It was a violation of the first two commandments. The introduction to the commandments, you know, begins with grace, not law. I am Yahweh, your God. I brought you up out of the land of slavery. See, grace. I brought you up out of the land of slavery. Therefore, no other gods besides me. All those other gods, they didn't bring you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. They didn't love you and feed you in the wilderness. They didn't preserve you as a people. They didn't call you. I did. What are you doing? Worshiping those other gods is breaking my heart. This is like a marriage. You're being unfaithful. But you know, there was more to it than that. That was breaking God's heart and making God angry. Remember the great commandment, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's actually in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6. And the, and the other one that Jesus said was like the great commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? That was in Leviticus, the Old Testament too. Jesus didn't make those up. They're both in the Torah. And part of the problem was not only was Israel not loving God back, they weren't loving their neighbors either. And so God in the book of Amos says lots about how Israel is treating the needy and the poor. I'm going to give you a sample of it, but it goes on for chapters. God says, you trample the needy and do away with the poor. When you sell things to the poor, your scales cheat them. And you mix in the sweepings of the floor when you sell them wheat. You buy them, you buy the poor for silver, for a pair of sandals. You trample the poor and force them to give you their grain. You buy up the property of the poor and join it to your own, property after property after property. And where are they going to live? How will they make a living and care for their family? Do you think I don't love those people too? Aren't they my people? You turn justice into bitterness. You hate the one who reproves you in court. You despise the one who tells you the truth. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts. You oppress the righteous. You take bribes, which the poor can't pay to get justice. You lie on beds of inlaid ivory, you lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs. Drink wine by the bowl full. You strum on your harps like David. But, but you do not grieve over the ruin of my people, Israel. So, God says, I will never forget
You know, where did all that wicked behavior that had God so unhappy, where did that come from? The answer is, it came from following someone instead of God. From following some things instead of God. From following principles instead of God. For following the world instead of God. We may think idolatry is sort of like, you know, like this old-fashioned sort of weird stuff where people offered gifts to idols. What a dopey thing to do. But it led to tragedy and injustice. That was an affront to Almighty God and, just to put it in extremis, all the kids are in Sunday school. The idolater is living all around the people of, of Israel, their neighbors, were sacrificing their own children to their gods and goddesses. And so was Israel, sacrificing their own children to put idolatry into high relief. Idolatry comes from making someone besides God the boss. One time, one of my grandchildren imprudently said to her grandmother, you're not the boss of me. Well, it turned out she was. <laughs> and the one who is the boss of us and the whole universe knows the cost of living some way instead of his way. So God said, all right, here's the judgment. I will stir up a nation against you, a nation that will oppress you, especially the leaders. When Amos heard that God was going to raise up an enemy against God's people, it broke his heart. And he pled with Yahweh, he said, O oh, sovereign Yahweh, forgive. How will your people Israel survive? They are so small. The prayer of a righteous man, a righteous person, availeth much, says the old language. And Amos prayed and he was a righteous person. And God relented. God said, All right. This will not happen. And God gave Israel more time. It wasn't too late yet. Not yet. And then, after Israel continued all the same stuff, it was too late. And God had had it. And could allow it to continue unaddressed no longer, or at least was not willing to. And about 20, 25, 35 years later, God sent Assyria, the most powerful nation in the world, against Israel. And they took the king ca captive, and he lost his kingdom, and his wives, and his wealth, and his armies. Assyria carried off 40,000 of the leading Israelites. The poor were too, you know, too insignificant to mess with. So it was the hotshots who went. And then it was too late. <clears throat> now, beloved, uh, this is the time in a sermon when the preacher normally turns to the application of the Word of God to the people of God and to the world and to uh, him or herself. And um, sitting at home are uh, four pages of notes that I wrote to apply this passage. Perhaps you're relieved that I didn't bring them. But what I thought we might do instead today is allow you to do some work with Almighty God by the power of the Spirit on how you think these passages apply to you and to the church, God's people, and to your friends, the people that we love in the world, and to the world. 
So to do that, would you kindly um, sit comfortably and come into God's presence? Would you even close your eyes, please? Maybe get your hands free of any stuff so you don't have to move for about three or four minutes. And uh, it helps, you know, to kind of get our bodies uh, ready to do what we want our, our spirits to do. So take in a nice slow breath, a big one, and hold it for a second, and then blow it out through your mouth. And do it again. Inhale the goodness of God. And exhale any distractions. And come into God's presence. Greet God. Tell God hello. Ask God to send the Holy Spirit to you as you meditate. So as you are in God's presence, what does Amos' prophecy suggest to you that you and the rest of God's people should be ready for? whenever Jesus, the King, the Judge, comes to judge the quick and the dead, what should you, what should the rest of us be ready for? Is there any warning to Americans who go to church who are religious? From Amos? From Matthew? And what might God's word to Amos and the coming of Jesus, the judge at any time soon, say to people who are employees, workers, about being ready? And to the people who decide how much to pay workers and what benefits? Does God's word provide a warning, an encouragement, a direction to Democrats and Republicans? God is not like a good, loyal American where we keep religion and politics separate. Is he? What's God got to say to Democrats and Republicans? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, you are righteous, true, loving, not to just us, but to all. We pray that the meditations of our hearts were acceptable to you. Would you, in loving mercy, send your spirit to us this week, again and again, to remind us how you want us to be ready to meet the Lord Jesus when he comes again. Thank you that it's not too late yet. Help us to use our time well. O oh God, our creator and redeemer, order our minds and actions so that they are pleasing to you. Help us to love you. Help us to love our neighbors as you have loved us in Jesus. We offer this in the name of the risen, glorified Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.